you, Sophia, for the very generous introduction. And I would like to thank Christophe and Ariel and, of course, the wider community of the RCC and, of course, the, including the uh, fellow London House Fellows uh, who have been giving me so, many, so much inspiration in this vibrant community. And uh, so I also like to acknowledge um, the key funders of my research, the Toshiba International Foundation, Oxford Sesakawa Foundation, and the Sainsbury Institute for the study of Japanese art and culture, among many others. Without their support, my academic journey hasn't been possible. Now, um, as Sophia mentioned earlier, I specialize in intellectual history of modern Japan. The area of study many people may not be so familiar with. So I would like to start um, my presentation by introducing the broader context um, of existing historiography on the study state of ideas and knowledge in modern Japan. So I'll start with the context and I will then show what kind of intervention my research makes in this field. And then go on to discuss a case study from the research, the core topic of my uh, presentation today. After elaborating on this study, I will briefly reflect on why such a study matter at all beyond the immediate field of my specialization. Um, so now, firstly, the context. The period of modern Japan is commonly known as the era of modernization through westernization, headed by the Meiji regime starting from 1868. The Meiji government regarded Asia-derived knowledge embraced by the previous Tokugawa period foolish and evil even, that should be discarded into the past. They instead adopted the dichotomized hierarchical epistemologies of modern Western philosophy and science, including the, the idea of social Darwinian survival of the fittest. So in order to survive in racial and social hierarchies, you must be the fittest. And um, this intellectual paradigm indeed placed the industrialized West as a foremost model of civilizational progress. My research, as Sophia mentioned, uh, delineates currently unknown intellectual paradigms of scientist polymers in modern Japan, whose work did not quite resort to the state-led ideas I have just discussed. The focus of my current, current research is a case of independent naturalist Kam Polymus, Minakata Kumagusu, who specialized in microbiology. You can see his portrait here. Um, in Japan, Kumagusu has been canonized as a pioneer of environmental activism and the intellectual giant. He published 51 articles in the scientific journal Nature and approximately 400 English essays and 600 Japanese works in humanities. While moving from Japan to the US and to Victorian London, he forced intellectual bonds with various historical figures, such as the Chinese revolutionary Sun Yat-sen and curators of the British museums, where he ended up advising them on Asia research at that time. Yet, he occupied a fairly marginal status in the, in the existing historiography. This is because, while absorbing European philosophy and science, he simultaneously embraced Asia-derived knowledge, including Buddhism, that was persecuted by the major government from its outset. His multidisciplinary knowledge production did not neatly fit within the increasing established, uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly established disciplinary divide established in, in universities, modern universities. So nobody quite understood what he was trying to do. I argue the underlying logic that unified the polymer's seemingly discursive range of thoughts and actions was what I conceptualize as queer nature, the very fundamental basis for truth. So as a case study, I will now demonstrate the ways in which queer nature emerged as the very nature of what it truly meant to be civilized. While he observed microbes through what can be recognized as Buddhist science in 1887 to 1892. And uh, this presentation is part of uh, my article, forthcoming article of the same title um, that will appear in the journal uh, Modern Age and Studies. So if anybody is interested, please uh, access the article in the near future. And it's also the very beginning bit of the monograph project that um, Sophia kindly mentioned earlier. So why nature 
Why is nature important in the question of what it truly meant to be civilized? And more broadly, within the question of modern intellectual history as a whole, the dominant theory of civilization in this period depended on how one understood the nature of society compared to the nature of the universe. So by nature, I mean innate nature rather than external uh, environmental nature as such. Um, and this included evolutionary nature discovered by modern science. Nature provided the empirical foundation upon which ideas of how society ought to evolve and therefore civilized. M therefore, modern intellectual argumentations on what it truly meant to be civilized depended on the knowledge of nature. And importantly, what knowledge mattered and why depended on the ideas of civilization theory. So, Korean nature resembled the micro slime mold in its ontological and experiential qualities. The Japanese term for slime mold, nenkin, or literally sticky bacteria, encapsulates what Kamagusu saw his, through his microscope. In this text, here you can see the drawing of the microbe he was looking at and uh, how he described this microbe. He wrote, quote, slime mold are utterly outrageous. Turning around and round, some of them move like amoeba. They harden themselves in whatever the way they like. End of a quote. Ontologically, the elusive biology of slime mold appeared to defy the bi biological dichotomies of male and female, plant and animal, and life and death. In today's science, it's been proven to know that uh, they exist in more than 600 different se biological sects. Experientially, this microbe never ceased to fascinate him. They inspired him to inquire further and extend his affective desire for intimacy with one another. I chose the term queer to name this nature because the historically diverse notions of English term the English term captures all of these characteristics. In Japanese, he illustrated his experience of knowing with words like myo, or strange, chin, curious, rare, and strange, or jose, affective human nature, and hoyu, intimate friend. I will elaborate more on this later. Knowing with and through queer nature as a result, Define the epistemological dichotomy and binary is the very foundation of modern European philosophy. I arrived at the notion of queer nature through examining primary historical sources on Kumagusu, including his diary, letter, notebooks, and essays, drawings, and specimens he collected. While exploring them, I noticed that his basis, um, his thoughts, emotions and actions appear to have emerged from a completely different basis of truth, this basis for truth, um, radically different from the state's West-inspired civilization theory. Queer nature began to emerge when the 20-year-old aspiring naturalist bot botanist Kumagusu arrived at the, arrived at the port of San Francisco, inspired to investigate the knowledge required to become civilized. There and then, the, the Meiji state's vision of civilization program he was taught in Japan slid down to the idea of retrogression, in a similar manner to what Chokonishi termed as the historical slide. It slid because the historical ground for the West-inspired civilization theory, namely the modern science and evolutionary theory, seemed relatively young compared to, for example, Buddhism. Um, and what is worse, the marker of the so-called civilized society in the US presented him, itself to him with an, an alarming degree of racial conflict and discrimination. The circumstance in Japan was no better at all. He resented, quote, looking back at the current situation in Japan, the society is horribly confused. Selling social and governmental ranks through engagement with intellectual research is equivalent to Khan and Ray. Here he referred to the fact that pursuing intellectual research became synonymous with the university degree, which in return opened a career within the government 
and higher end of social hierarchy. In his eyes, universities were essentially selling social and governmental ranks. Such a social change was equivalent to a historical incident of the late second century Japan, when abundant war under the reign of the emperors of Khan and Rei led to the near disintegration of the entire country, as recorded in Gokanjo, or the Book of the Later Han, recorded in the 5th century China. You can see here in the background. Kumagasu asserted the Japanese had to learn about their own country before they adore the West, mimicking the Westerners to, in order to claim that they too are civilized. The, dis the disillusion with the Meiji state and the West civilization theory coincided with the death of his male lover, Hayama Shigetaro, he left behind in Japan. Shigetaro's ill health did not let him survive as the fittest in the social Darwinian progress. The incident made Kumagusu conscious of the fact that the country, whose historical knowledge informed his lived experience of civilizing Japan during his formative years, was not those of the West disseminated by the, the state, the Meiji state. It was the knowledge of his home region, Ki, in southwest Japan, that derived from India and China. He decided to leave institutional education and rectify the history that validated the evolutionary narrative of society by turning his mind and heart back to the knowledge of the key. So um, this is the key vision, you can see here. And this is his, uh, the photo of him with his uh, boyfriend. And, uh, and it was, um, excuse me, um, here to the head temple of the Shingon Buddhism, you can see um, this is a mountain where the um, head temple of the Shingon Buddhism resided. It, it, it was a, it, it's a, a, Maha, a branch of Mahayana Buddhism whose teaching traced back to the Kushan Empire of the ancient India, resided on the top of this Mount Koya. Kumagu's parents believed in Shingon and he visited the temple various times while growing up. And since an early age, he immersed himself studying the 105 volumes of Tokugawa encyclopedic work of Wakan Sansaizue, originally inspired by a Chinese work of Ming Dynasty. So he copied every single volume of the um, encyclopedia as to absorb the, what their worldview. Um, both Shingon Buddhism and Sansaizue affirms non-binary ontology, sexuality, and epistemology evoked by the, his memory of intimacy with a no longer available, physically obtainable lover and his attraction towards the curious existence of microbe. The entanglement of these knowledges exper and experience became evident in how he described himself in the cu criticism of curious things, a handwritten newspaper he wrote for his friends who pursued 8080's movement for democracy freedom and people's rights movement. Many of them, the intended audience for the new, of the newspaper, you can see here in the background, um, fled Japan for San Francisco, seeking to nurture alternate civilizational agenda censored by the Japanese government. In this nature, Kumagasi illustrated himself as, quote, I'm a big scholar specializing in botany physiology, botany morphology, what an taxonomy and archaeology, and the mastery of Buddhistic, Confucian, and historic Japanese literature. So, end of quote. His, specialized, his specialities as a scholar were, furthermore, informed by his, his personal identification as, quote, formerly a Sangha in Jizo in Koya, meaning He's, he used to be one of the monks who lived under the Buddhist percept at the Shingon Buddhism in the Mount Koya. And I am presently the king of love. End of quote. This Buddhist king of love was a naturally, natural scientist fascinated by the utterly outrageous microbes. Embracing this persona, Kumagas merged Shingon Buddhism with science to observe the nature of evolution in the microbe slime mold. Both slime mold and Shingon Buddhism embody the core question of discerning the evolutionary nature in the non-West-centric intellectual paradigm. 
As Kermogusu sketched sketch the microbe, here you can see, um, the biological relation of slime mold to humankind became evident in his thought. He agreed with the British biologist Edwin Ray Lancaster, he became the uh, third director of the Natural History Museum later on, um, that slime mold was the oldest form of life on the planet. In Lancaster's book, De 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 Degeneration, a chapter in Darwinism, published in 1880, Lancaster argued that the evolution does not necessarily always result in so-called improvement. As such, even though the emergence of humankind occurred much later in time than the rise of slime mold, it could not be logically argued that humankind was a spirit of life form. The slime mold manifested two pivotal observations of evolution in nature. Firstly, the microbe demonstrated that social evolution can retrogress, a key witness in American society. Secondly, it improved that neither the microbes' seemingly asexuality nor their body's sex sexual ambiguity hindered evolution. There had to be reasons why such organisms still exist. Shingon Buddhism, in the meantime, asserted equality of all living beings, unlike social Darwinism worldview that divided humanities with hierarchy. What's more, similar to scientific inquiry, Shingon Buddhism illuminated the truth of the universe. Shingon literally me meant words of truth. The secret truth of Dainichi Nyorai, you can see uh, Dainichi Nyorai sculpture here from the Mount Koya, the primordial Buddha that symbolized the true state of the universe. As the Kumagusu merged Shingon Buddhism with science to observe the microbe, Kuro nature emerged. The epistemology of his Buddhist science did not adopt a dichotomized worldview of subject versus object, or the Cartesian mind over matter, engraved in modern Western philosophy and science. Instead, his Buddhist science embodies a symbiotic phenomenology of Mahayana Buddhism, to which Shingon Buddhism belonged. Here's a subject of observation in the world of matter, here you can see, um, emerged in reflection of the observer's kokoro, uh, or the Japanese notion of mind-heart, where the in, um, intellectual recognition happened hand-in-hand hand with emotional experience. Examining them, his yearning for intimacy with the physically unobtainable male lovers emer merged with his curious surrounding, curiosity surrounding the strange, outrageous microbes and desire for greater intellectual inquiry. The nature, the basis for truth, for what it truly meant to be civilized, emerged as queer nature. Slime mold he saw through the microscope strangely resembled a human sexual organ. Observing them filled his mind and heart with what he referred to as jose, or in English, affective human nature. The notion of Jose in this context derived from one of the founding fathers of historiography in Asia, Sima Qian, or Shibasen in Japanese. Sima Qian developed a kidentai, a synthetic method of producing records of changing world, i.e. civilization, in the early Han Dynasty China. According to Kumagasu's understanding of Tima Chuang, uh, Jose affected human nature was the wealth that can be generated through jitsugyo, or business, a basis of a civilization that all nations and each race should learn together while helping each other, so he argued. Now, this was shortly before the notion of business came into popular use in the history of capitalism in Japan. The notion of wealth, however, had nothing to do with financial or territorial gain, with which the Meiji state was concerned amid raising, rising international capitalism that originated from the 16th century Europe. These conceptions, pivotal in modern Japan, instead derived from the early Han Dynasty China. In, in Kumagusu's intellectual paradigms that emerged from queer nature. He then imagined, quote, a different kind of civilization, end of quote, 
by comparing cross-mixing of human race to microbial osmosis shortly before he left of Cuba in search of rare slime mold. He, however, never wrote a cohesive thesis on his own civilization theory. But as an analyzed wide range of primary historical sources, while asserting queer nature at his basis for truth, reveals some ideas he interwove in between his diary, letters, research notebooks, and, the aut or, and some autobiographical novels he wrote. Firstly, civilizing subjectivity, in his theory, simultaneously embraced independence and collectivity through cooperation beyond imposed epistemological divides among race, sex, and nationalities. Secondly, he indicated that people civilized through self-knowledge, independent of unquestioning reliance on state-provided knowledge. And thirdly, his self-knowledge elucidated affected the dire for each other, inviting collectivity unbounded by binary sex, life, death, and the normative racial taxonomy imposed on human being. Kumagusa's civilization theory thus carried a utopian yearning to liberate himself and others from epistemological constraints of racial and sexual biases and hierarchical social conditions amid emotional and intellectual struggles. In fact, ideas similar to Kumagusa's civilization theory existed in modern Western political ideologies, such as anarchism and socialism, his Japanese friends who pursued the freedom and people's rights movement in the US supported. One could identify by the name, them with naming of shugi or ism in modern Japanese. But Kumagusa criticized them as temporally, temporal privileging of modern Western thought in history. The ideologies that argued for freedom and equality of people were not new at all. He argued that they were continuation of pre-modern ideas that existed for thousands of years in Buddhist thought. Kumagusa rhymed in the manner of Tokugawa period comedy literature. Quote, the world is fast changing, but what, what does not change is the nature of human being. Anarchism and socialism, whatever is goodism. So many men, so many minds, 33,000 333 isms of the Buddha at the temple of Sanju Sangendo. Now, Sanju Sangendo was a Buddhist temple in Kyoto built in 1164. A historical anecdote of the temple famously suggested that if observed carefully, one could find a face of the person they longed to meet among the temples of 1001 golden statue of the goddess of compassion canon in her thousand arms incarnation. The one Kumagusu was dying to see was of course his lovers who he nurtured intimate relationship as adolescents. He declared the isms he could not possibly abandon were the rising affect and desire for loved ones. An interpersonal relationship he explicated as Hoyu, intimate friends, one of the five ethics in Confucian thought, activated his affect and desire for collectivity. The encounter with Kumagusu's ism that embraced his ideas for civilization theory happened through the independent study of Kuan nature in microbe that reflected his self knowledge of yearning for intimacy beyond epistemological divide and desire for greater intellectual curiosity. Now, to conclude, I would like to briefly reflect on why this research matter at all beyond the history of modern Japan by addressing three key points. Firstly, the research essentially opened a historical trajectory to today's shifting epistemologies in the time of planetary crisis, where entanglement of meant between culture and nature are, uh, again, inescapable. And secondly, secondly, while doing so, I showed how such an entanglement brings together European philosophy and science with Asia-derived science, history, philosophy, religion, and even the literary art into a singular narrative of history. 
The interdisciplinary and interregional approach demonstrates a way of understanding our planetary past that cannot be understood through established divides of disciplines and area studies. And finally, this paper ultimately opened a historical time and space that emerged from queer nature away from the teleology of civilization and development, modeled after the genealogy of the monolithic West. The historical paradigm that revolved around the West has left an immense impact on the ways in which philosophical theories arise even in contemporary debates. Queer theory is one of such instances. Dominant philosophical propositions of queer theories today emerge within the intellectual milieu of continental philosophy and Western biological science. Queer nature is a way of navigating intellectual history that surfaced from my hermeneutic analysis of primary sources produced by Kumagusu within the specific context of modern Japan, situated within particular social and personal condition, inseparable from the Asian intellectual lineages. Does the study invite further questions on how scholars may be able to liberate other familiar ideas and methods from the conventional paradigm, arrive at novel approaches and discern overlooked or marginalized historical phenomena, as I demonstrated in this presentation? Thank you.